about uh, network management information system. Uh, in 1999, I released an uh, uh, open source Perl package to uh, the internet, and it's now been out there for 15 years. Uh, it's been going well. It's had a long involvement. There was a very active community with it. Uh, I don't, know. <laughs> I don't even remember the timeline much anymore. Um, and the point is, it's there to manage routers, switches, servers, uh, UPSs, just about everything. It collects time series data, and while it's doing that, it also does fault management. So while you're already touching the device to collect disk CPU load or something else, we go, hey, why don't we just look at some other things that we can look at while we're already touching you? So we go touch an interface, and we check that the interface is up or down. Now, when you're running network management interfaces, the whole network, everything's about interfaces. Um, and sorry, just maybe the background there is I was a CCIE before I even started writing the software. So, um, you know, I had customers coming to me all the time as a, sorry, CCIE is a Cisco certified internet network expert. Uh, that's something that there's lots of now, but back then there wasn't very many of us, about three or 4,000 at the time. So, you know, customers kept coming to me saying, I want to run my networks, I can't manage my networks properly, what do we do? I had a software background, so I did what we open source people do. I looked at some open source packages, found something, saw some good ones, you know, found some better ones, and then wrote a bit of glue to tie it all together, and that's what NMIS started as. And then over the years, it's just taken off, right? It's just uh, lots and lots of stuff happened, and there's a lot of history there. So the, the, the point is that we collect performance data from just about everything we can, anything that talks SNMP, and we've also add, added in more recently, we've added in support for other sorts of uh, things as well, but we also do faults. So when we talk to a router and we ask it how its interface is going, we also check the status of the interface. Sounds kind of trivial, but we check the state, we've got a state engine built in, and if the state's changed, we raise an alert, right? So, or we tell it that it's fixed. So these are kind of really obvious things as soon as you think about them. Apparently, they're not that obvious to other people doing performance management systems. <laughs> so you get fault for free. You're already polling the device, you get fault for free. We threw in a thresholding system, so you can threshold everything that you're performing, uh, or the, that your performance management's doing. Uh, you can grab, um, you know, as you're collecting the CPU load, you check it against time, and you say, what did I do for the last whatever minutes? And then you check it against your thresholds, and you raise an alert. So again, really handy stuff, um, and, and this works really well. So that's a quick background. There's lots and lots and lots and lots of things that myself and some of the team are here and some of them are run away that we've learned about network management and good things to do, and that includes server management. A lot of what we do today right now is actually managing servers. You know, we're running about 50,000 device, managing 50,000 endpoints in Mexico, for example, right now with this software. So you know, we, we've gone from very, very small scale, it's runs on a VM using two gigs of RAM, or scales up to clusters using you know, 10, 10, 20 VMs running three or 4,000 nodes each, right? So go very, very small, can go very, very big. Um, you know, as, as this is supposed to be a sort of tutorial, is there anything that anyone wants to know about things around good ways to do network management? Um, and that includes server management as well. Uh, yep? It, it actually wasn't a competitor when, oh sorry, the question was, um, uh, is it a, comp a competitor to Nagios and NetSaint? So in fact, NMIS I think started either at the same time or just before or just after Nagios. It didn't even know Nagios existed. Back then, Nagios just did port polling. All it did back then was it would pol port poll eight, uh, 80 and 21 on a server and go, it's down, it's up. And it pinged things, that's all it did. Right? I, I looked at it and I went, oh, I don't even remember. It was called NetSaint and it changed to Nagios. Right, so NetSaint existed, Nagios didn't exist. They changed names somewhere in there. Yeah, and Nagios means NetSaint ain't going to insist on the same good or something. What are those yeah, there was actually a whole forking thing that happened and some, some, some guy decided to not do it anymore and some other guys took the code and kept going, I think from vague memory. So um, I, wasn't, I didn't want that. I wanted performance management for Cisco routers especially. I was rolling out these large, at the time, large Cisco networks, so we wanted to monitor CPU load, memory usage, interface usage, and things like that. So it, it wasn't, at the time, a competitor to Nagios, it's, it's saying at all. It didn't do, you know, there were actually ships in the night. And lots and lots of people, and that, in fact, there's a commercial company called Open something or other in the UK who took Nagios and took NMIS and put them together and sold it. Right, because they're, comp they're actually complementary in that respect. It's only Nagios has only added all these plugins stuff in the last, 
what to me it seems like the last five or six years, that's when they've sort of done a whole bunch of new stuff and now they're doing performance management, which is all through plugins. So they've added this plugin thing and people have just, just kept writing plugins that you can do more and more stuff with Nagios. And I don't keep up with the details because we've kind of done the opposite. We, we do the SNMP polling and we added a, um, Eric, Eric Greenwood's the, the other major developer back in the, um, in, back in the old days, you know, in the, in the, in the noughties. And so Eric uh, added all the server management in because he was using it to manage his customers' networks out of New Zealand and he needed server management. So he added service polling and all sorts of stuff into it. So at that point, I guess we stepped on to what Nagios was doing. Um, one thing we get from our customers today is they don't want to install Nagios and NMIS and commercial applications. They just want to have, they want to try and get down to fewer applications they do to run their IT environments. Right, so they're trying to find a platform that manages more things, and that's where we've actually helped, been able to help them a lot. Because we do do servers, we do do routers, firewall switches, and we're completely extensible. So I can talk about extensibility. Um, but does is any, any more questions? Yeah. Um, do you guys get much requests for pushing the output of your stuff into sort of the management dashboards and, and stuff like that? Yes, in, in fact we get lots and lots of requests for that. Uh, the system's open, being, being open source, being Perl based, it's naturally open. Uh, we use RRD for the, the round robin you know, as a performance database. Um, and so we basically, and there's a whole bunch of APIs that aren't particularly difficult or you know, hard or easy to use, that they just got to use them. Um, but it's amazing how developers will always find a way to do something the hard way. You know, and then you go, by the way, have you seen this little bit of fragment of code that'll just solve that problem for you in three lines instead of you know, 500? Um, so yes, cu customers have actually just taken NMIS and then run that as the main engine, and then they just run something that just copies the data out and pushes it in somewhere else. Uh, we've just, one of our commercial modules that we've done, and this goes back now, so when our Opmantic's now a commercial company, commercialised around NMIS and around Open Audit. Um, so we do add-ons, so how do you make money out of open source? You have an open source, you know, one way, open source core product services, and then we do these commercial add-ons. So we actually have a commercial add-on that plugs into NMIS, collects all the data, and presents all the data through a full RESTful API. So you just go and ask it, give me a list of nodes, give me a list of um, objects, we call them resources, but you know, whatever you want to call them, you know, give me a list of things that you're managing, give me a list of what you can tell me about those things, and here's a graph. And you get a graph back out of it, and then you, you get that as a JSON object, and then you decide what you want to do with it. So absolutely, we get absolute requests for that, and, that's a, and people are happily pay us to get that add-on to NMIS. Okay, any, no specific questions? Okay, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, I mean, because I can't do a screen share for stupid, whatever stupid reason. Um, let's talk a little bit about server management because, you know, I think you guys all deal with servers and you run servers. Yeah? Is this kind of something interesting? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so a couple of things we've learned. So Alex and um, Mark and Mark and I all work together. We run, like I said, a bunch of servers all over the place and we've got our applications running. We're using MongoDB for some of our applications. So we've learnt some kind of interesting things over time. Um, one of the big things that we find in, <clears throat> you know, so we got what the standard resources that we have inside, a, inside an object, almost everything is we've got CPU, we've got memory, right? And then I'll leave a gap there. So then we have something sort of disk slash storage of some description. And then we have some sort of network thing, so interfaces or network. So then inside memory, we have a bunch of different types of memory, right? So we have physical memory, and then we have um, virtual memory, and then sometimes we have swap. Uh, and then, and then in um, Linux, we get cache memory and buffer, isn't it? It's cache and buffer. I think it's called buffer. I just get confused because Cisco routers have got buffer as well. Um, so what we found is, you know, the cache and swap buffer are really good to, to manage. But what we're finding a lot now is a server, a server will typically go and use 99.8% of its memory and be happy. That server will operate and you'll see the gra memory graph just sit there pinned at 99.8% all the time. And it might go up and down by a, a percent or two, but the, the OS is managing itself, the, the uh, applications and services running on the system are demanding lots of memory. So the operating system, Linux, is very, very happy to hand over lots and lots of memory and it'll, it'll sort of balance itself out around 95 to 100%. It'll, it'll normally be about 99.8%. Um, 
So then the second thing we see is that swap space on a, on a system that's not crashing, I'm just talking about here, <laughs> um, will we'll sit at you know, 10.x percent. It'll, it'll stay under 11 percent. And we've seen, again, seen that very, very consistently. Um, swap uh, will, if you allocate to an 8 gig machine, we've got a, a VM we run on the cloud, we, it's got two gig of swap, 8 gig of real memory, 2 gig of swap, and the, the swap sits very, very comfortably at um, 210 megabytes is all it's using. Um, and then it sits at 99%, so it's using basically all of its 8 gigabytes of memory. Right, and that, that's pretty good. What we find is the CPU load, um, so then we have, you know, user, system, uh, I.O. is the big uh, weight I.O. or yeah, weight I.O. I.O. weight. And there's one I'm missing. These two are usually, there's several I'm missing, but these are the interesting ones. So user and system are pretty handy. They just tell us how much load, what, what's actually running on the system and what, what load's being generated. And that, they're pretty good. What we've generally found is the big yells to us if there's a problem with a server are this one and this one. As soon as we see the swap go high, it goes above 11%, we just see the machine usually is having a, a struggle. And then when we've got weight I.O., um, yeah, it's kind of like about 3 to 5%. Around there, we usually start to see problems. It can, if it's a small, if it's a little burst, like maybe 5 or 10 minutes of 3 to 5%, that's okay. If it goes up over 5% and stays there for a while, the machine's got some serious problems. So. We usually see weight I.O. And, and swap go in together, but that's the metrics that we've discovered. When a server's behaving, it'll stay inside those main, main things. And this is a Linux server, of course. That, that's sort of the big tip I can probably give you around um, performance management, and we've seen this consistently on servers under fairly high load in production environments, and this is the sort of thing, and this is virtual servers as well as physical servers. We've seen that this has been, um, been pretty consistent. Is that useful to anyone? Yeah. Cool. So, um, if Alex was here, he'd actually tell you, he's just outside, I can see there, but he'd actually tell you all about cache memory. I can't remember. Um, but what, we, what you don't want to see is you don't want to see cache memory free. You basically want to see cache memory being used a bit. So when it's free, when it's empty, you've actually got a problem, the system's not operating. So you actually want to see this being, and I, don't, I can't give you a number, but you do not want to see it at zero. So not zero, right? You want it anything but zero. You want it above, not, you want it sort of above, I don't know, 20, 20 or 30%. I, I can't remember if, if it's the same amount as the physical memory. But you know, there's a, you always want it a bit high. As soon as it goes to zero, something's going on. The machine's changing around what it's caching in memory, and it's changing around its virtual memory page space, and doing crazy things. So when you, we just spotted that on a server earlier today, thing went to zero. You know, some systems and processes had restarted. You know, Java Java memory um, garbage collection had happened or something, and the cache memory dropped to zero. The machine recovered. You know, by itself it was all good, but it was just an early warning for us. Okay, what about um, networking? Does anyone want tips on networking? Collisions Sorry? Collisions are bad. Collisions are bad. So in a switched environment, this is actually just a tip. So in a switched environment, you should not see a collision. If you've got collisions in a switched environment, you have a big problem. Does anyone know what a collision is? Cool, does anyone not know what a collision is? Okay, so... The, what, what is really key to watch is errors and discards. That's actually, you know, we don't get er collisions anymore, we get errors and discards. So typically you would get input errors and output discards. So if a, if a router or a switch is unable to do, to process packets and put them back on the wire, it discards the packet. You typically don't see discards on switched, er switched networks because switched networks are cut through. They'll take a packet from the wire, uh, it's processed in, in an ASIC or in an FPGA and sent straight back out. So you'll typically see, uh, not see output discards on a switch. It can happen under certain, you know, certain types of switches and certain models and stuff, but on a, a good sort of brand, name brand switch that's HP, Cisco and so forth, Netgear, you know, you're going to not see uh, discards. You will see input errors. So input errors, if I had a, a fibre optic between me and you and it was maybe stretching over 25 kilometres, um, and there was some problem on that line, which may be intermittent, then I would see input errors on one of the ports. 
Typically, if there was some sort of problem, that would be a CRC framing error, like some, something, a, a bit of glass, something's happened, there's been a, an interruption to transmission, and I would get an input error. So when you're monitoring links on, on network devices, input errors and output discards are really, really handy. Um, routers can usually run at pretty high interface utilisation. Switches, depending on the brand, if you're using uh, like a Netgear switch, it'll be using the Broadcom chipset. The Broadcom chipset can only do eight ports at... Um, I can't remember the exact numbers. It's like it, it's got a shared bus of uh, one gigabit per second for eight ports. So you can't have all eight ports running at wire speed. That's the difference between a $200 switch and a you know, $2,000 switch. When you've got a $2,000 switch, you can have all ports running at wire speed to all ports. So pairs of ports can be running at gigabit in and out at the same time. Um, so when you get, you know, you'll find patterns where you, you see a little Netgear switch can be doing three or 400 megabits per second between two, two servers. You add the third server, and, and do some more transfer, everything will drop down to, you know, to 200 megabits per second, which is still pretty significant, it's still pretty good. Yeah? So, uh, do you guys, with your system, uh, Nigel's just given a nice feature where you can define a topology, and you can certainly do things like service monitoring, you know, I know I've got a switch here, and then I've got a bunch of services behind here, and I know that this service is can't yeah. get out, and this switch is, unless it switches up, so if it switches up, I, don't, I automatically say, these are all bogus and down. Yes, we have a dependency feature. Yeah. It's called depend. Yeah. So you just de you just name your dependencies and we don't, you know, if you have a switches and routers and, and, you know, big topologies, this happens all the time, you name your dependencies just like you said, this node's dependent on that node, you don't get the, you don't get the alert. Cool, anything else? Okay, well I hope that was useful. <laughs>